Gustav Rau's first purchase of a work of art was in 1958, when he bought a study of a cook by Gerrit Dau. Not a bad first foray into the art world to acquire a work of art by one of Rembrandt's most able pupils. From then on for the next 45 years, he acquired a fantastic and famous collection that embraced not only old masters, impressionists, but sculpture, ivories, furniture, and African art. He was not a slave to fashion, but bought things that amused him or he found aesthetically pleasing. And behind me is a perfect example of what that is. This is one of two paintings by the 17th century Spanish artist Thomas Yepes. He's normally a bodegon painter, a painter of still lives, which he focuses on with almost botanical accuracy. But what Gustav Rau has chosen is two paintings with a landscape background, where the artist has produced something rather fantastical. The chances of catching a kingfisher balancing on a nigella stem is pretty unlikely. But what he has attempted to do is create an almost tapestry of colours and shapes, and I think he achieves this with absolute brilliance. The large walnut tree at Pontoise is in many ways an archetypical um, impressionist picture by Pizarro, uh, and as such is, is, is a wonderful demonstration of Dr. Rao's skill in, in finding both very beautiful works of art and also key points in the development of, of, of art history. It's painted in 1875, uh, so the year after the first exhibition that became known as the first Impressionist exhibition. And it illustrates all those things that made uh, Impressionism such a, such a powerful movement in painting. It shows a subject that, that wouldn't have been considered by, by the academic painters of the, of the 19th century. It's a, it's a quiet rural scene, it's not didactic, it's not historic, it's not symbolic, it's simply two figures walking down a quiet pathway in, in Pontoise where Pizarro lived in the 1870s. And, and more importantly, it's, it's showing exactly that idea of, of Impressionism. It's painted with, with little dabs of almost unmixed oil paint to give the impression of the light pouring through the trees, of the light hitting the further fields. It's something that Pizarro started seeing as a, as a young man, as a young painter in, in Venezuela which he then takes on to his views in, in France. And particularly, as I say, in this, in this key moment in, in Pontoise, when he's working with, with Cézanne particularly, and later on with, with Gauguin. So in a way, the, 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 the large walnut tree picture is, uh, in its small scale, it's, it's a summation of, uh, of everything that, that Pizarro and the Impressionists were trying to do. And fundamentally, it's a very beautiful picture. The portrait behind me is by Pierre-Paul Proudhon of the Duchess of Montebello. As a young man, Proudhon went to Italy, where he was particularly struck by the works of Leonardo, Raphael and Correggio. So perhaps it's appropriate that he should have painted the portrait of the very beautiful Duchess, who was described by her friend, Laure Juno, as being so beautiful she could have been the model for either Raphael or Correggio. The collection embraces works of art from various different disciplines, but all at the highest level. A large crucifixion which is in a state of preservation I've rarely seen from a painting executed around 1470. A fine ivory and wood carving of Jupiter and his eagle by the 18th century Austrian Baroque sculptor Simon Troger. A brilliant miniature landscape by the gifted 16th century Flemish artist Hans Boll, painted in gouache on vellum. A sparkling river landscape on an autumn day by Henri Martin. A handsome faience bust of Ceres made in Rouen in the 19th century. A most unusual trompe l'oeil tabletop, which once was a table, by the early 19th century French portrait painter Louis Leopold Wailly. There are occasions at auction 
when one is fortunate enough to sell examples of works by the greatest masters. There are perhaps more frequent occasions when one sells masterpieces by lesser artists. However, to actually sell a masterpiece by one of the greatest masters of all time is really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This series of Fragonard's fantasy portraits is widely regarded as Fragonard's supreme achievement, like nothing else in 18th century art. The present portrait has only changed hand once in its lifetime when Dr. Rao bought it in 1971. Of the 16 in the series, nine now hang in the Louvre and only two others remain in private ownership. There has been some debate over whether this series was intended to be portraits in the sense of depicting a specific likeness of a sitter. In this instance, a drawing is known of the Duc d'Arcour, which is in the Musée de Beaux-Arts in Rouen, from which the sitter can be securely identified. We also have the tradition in the D'Arcourt family that it was one of six portraits painted on the occasion of a fancy dress party at the Pavilion de Fantasy at the Chateau d'Arcourt. While Fragonard's influence was minimal in his own day, he can now be regarded as a proto-impressionist who influenced the likes of Daumier, Renoir and Manet. Thus, while his innovative subject matter raises this painting well above other French paintings of the 18th century, his extraordinary skill and technique establish it to be one of the great artistic achievements of all time. This powerful portrait by Michel Miravelt is of the no-nonsense courtier and politician Sir Henry Vane. He served in Parliament for 40 years and was only absent in the session of 1629, for in that year he was sent on a mission by Charles I to the Stadtholder in Holland, and in 1630, on that trip, he had his portrait painted. This part of the collection of Dr. Gustav Rau is being sold to benefit the German Committee for UNICEF and, therefore, children in need around the world. Peter Ustinov once said, I haven't